Hey everyone. So first of all, welcome back. Uh, now that you've had a week uh, to sort of get the foundation of the class and understand a little bit about globalization and some of the pros and cons of globalization. Uh, the good part is people trade across different avenues and it certainly builds a lot of wealth for countries if they have resources. The bad part is that there are other aspects of it that can be very complicated, particularly when the rich countries get together and collude against the poor countries or exploit the resources of the poor countries. Uh, now we're gonna take this to the next step. And the next, this week, we're gonna be looking at chapters eight and nine uh, which really contend with the issue of war and peace. And it's interesting because on one hand, the question simply is, you know, as civilized human beings, why can't we just get along, right? Why, why are we sitting here in the 21st century and we're still struggling? We've had wars in Afghanistan, we have wars in Ukraine, you know, there are lots of civil wars going on around the world constantly. Uh, and so we're going to look at this today, and we're going to look at some of the causalities and uh, nuances of war and peace. And really, one of the things I'm going to ask you when your discussion is whether you think peace is even viable or possible today. Uh, you would think in civilized human beings that it would be possible to reason your way through not killing other people. But nonetheless, we see this happening more and more. Uh, it used to be a time when money really became the source of diplomacy and people stopped shooting at least the major powers stopped shooting and killing each other. But it doesn't mitigate the fact that smaller countries and smaller powers uh, continue to do these things. And now, as you've seen with Ukraine-Russia crisis or war, if you would, uh, people are, are uh, again, doing what was unpredicted, which was that civilized modern democracies, uh, supposed democracies, would be attacking and shooting one another. So uh with that you know there's some other things that play into this as well that i think are interesting and some of the issues surround the issue of money uh, a lot of the resources and money drive a lot of what the causalities of war uh for example um if you go back and look at uh world war ii for example in the war with japan well of course for us it's the shock and awe of december 7th 1941 and the bombing of pearl harbor right but Many people don't realize that we had squeezed Japan, who was only commodity to get oil for its manufacturing and industry in Japan, was through the Philippines. And so Japan attacked the Philippines, which the United States then cut off their resource to the Philippines, which crippled the Japanese economy. So what we look at as a surprise attack really wasn't quite a surprise when you think about, you know, what would we do if, if somebody had cut off our economic resource? Uh, a matter of fact, it's in our policy, defense policy, see, that anything that threatens the U.S. economy, we, had, we justify going to war or attacking another adversary if it, if it threatens our economic uh, viability. So if you think about it, the Japanese may have been justified, regardless of the twisted, you know, uh, part of, the, uh, of, their, of their philosophy regarding the military and uh, use, use of the military in this instance. There's a justification on some level why, why I would argue that it really wasn't quite the surprise attack that we really thought it was. Um, and you can go throughout history and see these kinds of things play out. But nonetheless, you know, the, one of the things that really begs the question is, you know, about human beings and our human nature. And Thomas Hobbes, a famous philosopher, a political philosopher from the 18th century, uh, wrote a very famous book called The Leviathan. And the, the basic premise of the book is basically that Human beings are basically wired to be warlike and violent and aggressive. So therefore, wars are kind of inevitable or violence or actions of these types are, are inevitable because it's in our nature. So therefore, we need to have strong institutions and infrastructures in place to, to control those who would, you know, then for try to assert violence toward one another. Uh, and that's an interesting question, you know, is this just part of our DNA that we're violent toward one another? and that the idea of peaceful existence doesn't really exist. Uh, and if that's the case, then we have a bigger problem. I choose, I personally choose not to follow Hobbes in this. I want to believe that there are more good people than bad people, but maybe there is some aspect in our personal DNA that uh, means that we will do whatever we have to do to justify actions that could include even going to war. Um, so with that, what I want to do here now, I'm going to jump into uh, the PowerPoints for this week, I'm going to walk you through a little bit of some of the ideas about what war is. And then also we'll look at some of the aspects of 
those entities that exist to try to promote peace, like the United Nations, which is probably the most important one uh, that exists today to try and uh, bring about peace uh, in the world. Um, it's not perfect, but it certainly is a better than nothing, I would say, by far. So let's take a look at this uh, and jump into the book a little bit and, uh, and see what we've got here. So again, as I said, this chapter is on, uh, on war and conflict. And so uh, with that, the idea is to sort of understand, you know, so why do we go to war? You know, why do wars exist and, and how do we work our way through this process and decide what's best for each country? And a lot of times, like I said, you'll see that, you know, those countries like the United States and Russia and the superpowers that exist, European powers, for example, they have a tremendous amount of weaponry and, you know, the ability to do a lot of, inflict a lot of damage, uh, certainly can control the narrative and certainly can control a lot of the resources of the world just by flexing their military might, um, even though they certainly try to say that they don't, I would argue that, uh, if you looked at how much the United States spends, for example, on its military industrial complex, uh, it spends more than probably 24 to 25 wealth, you know, powers on the planet. And only one of them is really two or one or two are really adversaries. And uh, that is combined. Uh, we spend more, more, more money than any other country, than 24, 25 countries combined on our military industrial complex. That means that it's a big business. And when you have a big business, you have to be able to to justify what you're doing and, and how you're selling your resources. And that becomes a bigger problem. So let's take a look at this and uh, see what we come to. So, of course, you know, the idea of understanding that, you know, wars have existed, you know, since the beginning of time. And, you know, the question is, how have they evolved over this period? And certainly you could argue, if you look back in ancient history, that wars are fought over resources or if somebody was in a position near where you had, whether it be gold or some precious minerals or precious resources, or whether it was based on uh, water or food, uh, those types of resources that were basic for human existence. Uh, if somebody controlled those areas and you wanted those areas and perhaps you didn't have them and your, or your population was growing, you might attack them and take over uh, those areas and enslave the people. Uh, that was very common. Uh, and so that's basically, you know, the early part of uh, what warfare looked like. Uh, and some of them would argue that it was justified for survival, you know, and, uh, you know, there's all kinds of things around those discussions. Uh, it's interesting, there was uh, the Malians. I don't know, many of you may have read the Malian dialogue where the Athenians were going to attack the, the Malians, who are very peaceful people. And uh, we're going to basically to slaughter them and take their take their uh, their land, and you know, and, and enslave the people. And uh, the millennia, the Malians came to the Athenians and tried to have a rational conversation about why they shouldn't do that. <laughs> and uh, after you know, <laughs> after dialogue, you know, and the Athenians were like, "Thank you very much," and then they went in there and killed all of them. Uh, but the premise behind that is that one of the things that was asserted was that that. The strong do what they must, and the, and the weak, the weaker city states of those times suffer what they must. And I think that's kind of the wiring of the DNA even today. That poor countries tend to tend to suffer whatever the wealthy or most powerful countries want them to suffer with, and uh, that that is in fact a bigger problem uh, that's still part of our human nature and has been for thousands of years. Uh, so perhaps uh, Hobbes is right. Maybe maybe it is part of our wiring that we are aggressive, and uh, maybe we haven't evolved as much as we think we have. Uh, this particular map uh, shows you. Uh, let me blow this up a little bit so you can see uh, places where uh, the hot war that where hot wars exist or crises exist, and you can see. Um, uh, where armed conflicts have existed and where some of the where some of the serious conflicts are. Obviously, the Middle East is an area. Uh, and they look at it based on the number of fatalities. Uh, and so you see where the smaller, you know, where the lighter countries have less fatalities and darker countries have significantly higher fatality rates. Um, and then you can see here, um, in terms of number of conflicts, this goes from World War II to approximately 2014. You can see basically uh, across the map here, uh, Asia, 
uh, in Africa and the Middle East have had a predominant, the predominant number of conflicts have existed uh, throughout the last uh, 70, 75 years or so. Uh, and so this is just, you know, again, helps us understand, you know, obviously, if you look at Europe and the Americas, you know, more you know, tend to be more democratic in, in, their, in their political structures and democracies rarely go to war with one another. So it, it's sort of understandable why, why they have lower conflict rates. Middle East, of course, there's a lot of civil wars and civil conflicts, uh, along with Africa, a lot of tribalism. Asia, of course, with various Vietnam and this looks at, of course, Vietnam and Korea and uh, Southeast Asia and, and all the conflicts in North Korea. So you can look at and understand where some of the conflicts, why the numbers are higher in some areas than others. Now, um, we talk about conventional wars. Well, convent what are conventional wars? Conventional war is basically where I have my army, you have your army, we line up against one another and we go at it. And, you know, may the best group win. Uh, and we use conventional weapons to be able to fight these wars. You know, there may be tanks and aircraft and, you know, rifles and guns and so forth. Uh, this had basically been the type of wars that existed uh, for the last, you know, 250 to 300 years, when you had, even when you had large wars, whether it was World War One, World War Two, or even when you look at even smaller wars, but also when, you know, the Korean War, conventional weapons, Vietnam War, again, conventional weapons. Uh, but, uh, and there are other aspects. So you'll see when we, as we go into this discussion, the different types of warfare, and some of them overlap. Uh, if not, sometimes you'll see where sometimes if one type of war warfare is not is not working, uh, they may use other non-conventional methods to in order to fight wars. Okay, we continue here. And then civil wars. So civil wars are basically like wars that are uh, within within usually inside of a country. Uh, where you have factions or tribes within a country that are vying for power to control uh, either the, it could be the resources or the political infrastructure uh, of that particular country. Civil wars usually erupt. This is what you usually see in the Middle East and, and uh, also Africa where tribalism is, is significant. Um, and so you have little subgroups within those entities that are trying to buy for power. Some would even argue uh, that Ukraine-Russia crisis is a civil war because Ukraine, Ukraine actually was part of, well, actually Ukraine was there before Russia. And so technically the question of, it's like you're, they're, they're cousins and Ukraine didn't become Ukraine until probably 80, 80 or 80 years ago or so, maybe a little longer than that, but less than a hundred years. And so it was part of Russia and the Soviet Union. And so, you know, many, many people inside of Russia who support the Russian side of this of this battle of this war uh, would argue that it's a civil war. They're just trying to recapture part of what historically they believe was was their land. Now, asymmetric warfare uh, or asymmetric wars when you have two adversaries that could have a, a strong power, like you say the United States, fighting against a weaker power, um, and they, so they have to use the weaker power. Usually, has to use more unconventional tactics in order to fight that kind of war. So, how do you fight the United States? You know, in, in a regular war where there's no way you're going to beat us, you know, man to man, if you would, because we have significantly larger resources of weaponry and things like that. So, you may have to use other tactics uh, in order to fight a war like that. And that's typically what we see. The kinds of wars we see today that take place where we have an adversary that's smaller. Uh, you have to do different things. So even the war in Ukraine and Russia, as you could, the Ukraine is certainly is a smaller, is doesn't have nearly the resources that Russia has, but the war has been fairly successful for them in some ways because of the fact of the asymmetric fashion in which they're fighting the war and using guerrilla tactics and other things to be able to fight this war uh, in order to be, have some measure of success. And then another type of warfare you could argue would be terrorism. And terrorism comes in two different types of fashion. It's, it's psychological and it's also, you know, of course, physical. Um, someone who can blow up, you know, blow themselves up, suicide bombers, for example. Um, you could argue that could be used in asymmetric warfare, but it can also be utilized in terrorism. And you can kill a lot of, when person can come in, blow themselves up and kill a lot of people. Uh, and so uh, there isn't, since there isn't necessarily one defined definition, 
I would argue that it really is about inciting fear. It's a psychological factor of terrorism, the threat. It's because the, the thing is, once you, once you commit an action, even if you do one physical action, you could basically uh, control the outcomes of other people by simply the threat of another action, even if you never pull a trigger again. So you're able to still dictate the outcome even though you don't have all the weaponry or maybe you have, don't, do not want to use or blow up anything else ever again. Once you blow up one thing and they, people believe that you will, they will listen and be able to respond to whatever you're, whatever you're trying to get. Uh, and again, usually terrorism is, you know, focuses on you know, the innocent, uh, the non-combatants. So like you know, 9-11 terrorist attack against you know, innocent civilians um, in, in New York City. And, uh, so these are the kinds of actions that usually take place, and the goal really is uh, to really incite fear and basically, you know, uh, slap at entities that really are that really have a significant amount of power over you. You can see here uh, on this particular slide the number of terrorist attacks they have since uh, 1971. You can see how little they were back then, and then you had an upsurge in the 80s and 90s. Uh, usually based in the Middle East. And then by the late 2010 or so to 2015, uh, you see a significant higher, significantly higher rate of, uh, of attacks that, uh, since that time. And so the question is, so you know, why is that the case? And many people would argue that it's a factor of uh, asymmetric warfare, where those who feel justified in committing these kinds of actions that know that they don't have the capabilities to really challenge a direct frontal assault against America or another powerful, powerful superpower, it, they utilize these types of uh, situations in order to justify their actions and to be able to get the, the, globe, the world's attention. And certainly, you could argue this. It goes without saying that wars have certainly become more deadly um, in the in the. 21st century, even in the 20th century. Um, and this is basically makes perfect sense. I mean, you think about the technology and, and the development of weaponry, even for the, even nuclear weapons, you know, the, well, the bombs that blew up in Nagasaki and Hiroshima are a fraction, and I mean a fraction of, of the damage that the new thermonuclear weapons and, uh, can do now. I mean, the, our, yeah, the, the big weapons we have, it's incalculable how much damage they can do. Uh, if launched uh, at, a, at a site, it's frightening the amount of damage they could do. Plus, we even have the system called the MERV system. MERV stands for multiple entry, re entry, re uh, excuse me, multiple independent reentry vehicle. And basically means they could, they could literally have 10 nuclear warheads on one missile, shoot that missile up into, into the air, and then launch 10 missiles in 10 different directions. <laughs> off one missile so they can the nuclear weapons that are on the missiles can be armed and sent to 10 different 10 different areas uh, from one missile so you can see quickly how warfare and the strategies around it have certainly uh, increased and the way we try to mitigate some of this is what we utilize what we call uh, confidence and security building measures where we try to figure out how to make one both countries feel safe and secure and you know so that they don't attack one another or escalate uh, crises like this. This just shows you the number of deaths uh, uh, since war, after World War II. Uh, of course, the, this is the 50s. You had Korea, the Korean War here. That's why you see a little uptick during this area. Um, in the 70s also saw some uptick. Again, this is Vietnam. And then uh, again, in the 80s, uh, you had a little uptick here. This is a lot had with the Middle East and some of the strike crises that were there. Uh, and then you see how low it is. So most of these wars you see after World War II, though, were actually civil wars or they were or wars between states like, again, Korea was North, North versus South Korea, Vietnam, North Vietnam versus South Vietnam. Uh, so there's a lot of there's a lot of history in terms of what's driving the wars post World War II. So as you can see, as I said, you know, the wars have been more limited, but more deadly in terms of the types of weapons that are utilized. So you can kill a lot more people, um, 
But right now we've seen that there has not been a significant uptick in this uh, since uh, World War uh, II. Most of the wars that are taking place now are taking place, let me bring this down a little bit, uh, in the developing world, you know, which is, you know, we call the third world sometimes. Uh, a lot of these are civil wars or interstate wars. Uh, but again, this has been this, this has been the case all the way up uh, through World War II until the Ukraine-Russia crisis, uh, because we had not seen interstate wars between developed countries or developed states since the end of World War II. And now with Ukraine, Russia, that is the first time since World War II that we've seen this uh, take place. Again, the majority of wars since 1989 have been civil wars, again, in, in the, in, in the non-industrialized countries. Uh, so the wars are becoming more unconventional, again, utilization of terror, uh, terrorist acts. So we, they're basically considered what we call asymmetric, because again, you have differing powers, not powers with equal footing. Uh, fighting one another. Sometimes we call them proxy wars too, where the United States and say against the Soviet Union and they're fighting each other, but they're not fighting directly because they, that's what runs the risk of nuclear confrontation. But they'll use two countries to to fight the war before them. This is always this was the case a little bit in Korea and also the case in Vietnam. You know, ideological wars that are based on communism versus Western capitalism, for example. You know, and so understanding the context of civil wars is understanding some of the aspects that affect it. And that includes like you have ethnic differences, you have differences in, in religion, uh, you have various historical grievances and issues between tribes that could be hundreds of years old, sometimes older, and they just haven't let go of it, even though it might not even be relevant uh, today. Uh, and again, when we talk about relative dep deprivation, you're talking about access to resources. So if you have a, you have a, a country where you have, where one area is very th lush and thriving and has a tremendous number of resources and part of the other part of the country may have nothing. And so the, they're fighting each other because of lack of resources. Uh, and again, this just shows you an example of, this map shows you an example of where the interstate wars were, are the colonial wars and civil wars. Um, and you can see if you look around, particularly in Africa, and there are a lot of colonial wars uh, still in existence from the period of colonial times, which a lot of the history of these countries is based on the colonial powers that controlled them, mostly Western European powers that controlled them throughout the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. And again, uh, when we talk about the subfactors that lead to these types of conflicts, Certainly the territorial disputes are certainly a primary one, uh, acquisition of land. In fact, Russia's fighting Ukraine because they feel like it's part of their land. And the eastern part, the Dobas region, they're trying to get back. But really, I think their goal is to, come, to really get all of Ukraine back. Uh, creation of new nations, you know, those you know, entities that want to create new nations out of, the, out of an old nation. Uh, a lot of the Middle East fights are based on creating a caliphate or an independent nation for Islamic states. Um, there's ideologies uh, that lead to conflict. You know, when you have, even within Islam, there are multiple different types of Islam. You have Sunni and Shia Islam. And so those are the two primary ones. I mean, there's other ones as well, but the two primary ones don't like each other. So they fight simply because of ideology about, 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 the, uh, about their religion. And then of course, money, economics and money. I think money is probably drives a lot of what leads to conflict today, particularly amongst the wealthier states. Uh, they fight over resources and money. Uh, ethnicity and religion, of course, as I mentioned, absolutely. These are certainly aspects, you know, if you've got, you know, larger groups of, uh, in one, in the country of different groups, then somebody's vying for power or authority or, or control. Uh, this is another one of those uh, aspects that affects, and then predation is also another aspect. Um, so these are all different factors that lead to conflicts. Now, um, Having said that, let me jump back to uh, my other uh, screen and come back to you. Now, now that I've show, shared all that with you, I just want to say that in terms of the peace side of this, um, you know, one of the things about peace uh, is, you know, the idea of whether peace is viable. What does peace look like? Does peace mean that everybody just goes home and becomes friends again? Not usually. Usually it means that we agree to we agree to disagree or we draw a line in the sand and we figure out, okay, this is uh you know 
this is what I, you know, if there's a victor, then the victors will say, this is what we want, and this is what we're going to give you, and they dictate the terms. If there is no real victor, then they may have to come to a stand, agreement based on, okay, so what do you want versus what do I want, uh, so we can stop fighting. Uh, and this is probably frequently utilized these days, particularly where, like, it's even a situation when you look at, when you look at, uh, uh, Russia, Ukraine, in terms of how's that going to wind up or how's it going to end? Well, it's going to take some diplomacy. Uh, Putin has certainly drawn a line in the sand that I don't know if he can get back over in terms of being a world leader, uh, especially after the damage that he's inflicted on Ukraine. So that's going to be really interesting. The other part of this, I think, is also interesting is that the organizational that's put, organization that's put in place, which I'm sure all of you watched the video, already on this is the United Nations, which came into inception in 1945. Ironically, there was a precursor to the United Nations, uh, which was the League of Nations. And Woodrow Wilson uh, came up with this idea after World War I and a number of people who had died during World War I. Uh, so much of the youth of, of Europe was wiped out in World War I that the, and the number of people who died collectively at that point, no one had ever seen that kind of death and destruction. And of course, now we're dealing with technologies and weaponry at the beginning of the 20th century that they had never seen, not even 20 or 30 years earlier. So uh, the idea of recognizing that we needed to have a body of where, where countries could come and talk and, and dialogue with one another to try and prevent war uh, was their goal. Ironically, the League of Nations never went forward because <laughs> the United Nations, <laughs> I mean, I should say the United States, never agreed, never signed the agreement, even though it was thought up by the United States and thought up by, by Woodrow Wilson, the United States did not want to have another an international body dictate to it the terms of the agreement. So if we were doing something that was wrong, we didn't want anybody to tell us what we had to do. And so it's another, you know, almost 25 years before the United Nations comes into, or well, actually 26 years when the United Nations comes into deception after World War II, with the same goal in mind, to try and bring peace and peaceful resolution to crises and when the countries had disagreements with one another. And, you know, it's, it's a complicated organization because even though it has a peacekeeping force, it doesn't have a standing army, uh, to say, and so then the, there are and the, the countries that contribute the most to it uh, in terms of financially and, and even with human cost have a tendency to want to dictate the terms of the agreements within the United Nations. So the United Nations, United States is the greatest, is the biggest uh, economic resource for the, for the UN. And so they always want to have a little more clout um, in terms of what happens and the outcomes of the United Nations. And you know, on one hand, you could say, well, it makes sense, but all hell, it also leads a problem because even when we're guilty of things, uh, we don't want to have anybody dictate the terms of the agreements to us. Uh, and so the idea of peace, uh, what peace looks like today becomes much more complex. Uh, there are many people who believe that peace is, that peace in our lifetime and the way that we sort of want to understand it is not even a real viable thing. Uh, I would say that it may not be viable, but I think it's worthy of us to continue to try uh, that by not by assessing, by assuming that that's in fact the case and giving up on it would be a much da more dangerous world that we would live in than to try and to continue to try to find peaceful resolutions. Uh, and to this end, I mean, there's, there are good pros and cons of this. And, you know, the pro side of it is that, you know, we have, you know, when, it, when countries align together, to try to hold on to or create peaceful coexistence. That's, a, that's an uh, altruistic and admirable goal. On the other side of that, you know, the reason we've had world wars in the last 100, you know, 100 years is because of the same thing. Uh, the alliances of countries, if one country gets into a disagreement with another country, all the countries that are aligned with it then have to jump into the fight. And then, so that's how you get world wars. So the two, the two countries just fought themselves and whoever won won, would be less problematic, but that's not the way the world works now. So the pro side is, you know, yes, you can have, you can stop stuff, you know, when, you know if you want, if things can be controlled. The bad side is, and the other side of that is that sometimes you can't. And then when that happens, world crisis, global crises happen.
Okay, I think I've talked more than I had planned to today, but anyhow, I tried to give you a little bit of understanding of warfare and conflict and a little bit of also understanding what peace is. Make sure you watch the videos uh, for this because there are a lot there, but they're little short ones. There's only one long one that looks at the Russian crisis, which I think is really, really great. So please do look at it, and uh, I will see you in the back end, you guys. Take care.